What is up, World Wide Web? Thanks for tuning into Office Hours number three. Uh, pretty stoked on this. I have a guest that I got to know a little bit this week, which I'll introduce in a second. But before that, we just have a few, uh, just a few housekeeping items to take care of. Um, office Hours is meant for us to, for a moment to offer a bit of inspiration to creatives during this time. And it's just like a weird time with the pandemic and everything. And as a creative, it's a little hard because you can't really go out and create. So that's the purpose of Office Hours is to inspire you guys and just encourage you to get out and create, but also encourage you guys to check out our film festival, which is MIF. We put it on every year and it's usually hosted in New York, but obviously that's off the table right now. So this year we actually moved it all online, which is really rad because as much as we'll miss seeing everyone in New York, uh, the whole playing field is open now for everyone to submit a film. So MIF is now open. It used to only be 21 and up. Now it's for whoever. If you're under 18, you can get a parent and guardian signature, and you can still participate in MIF. And you have a few weeks to submit your films. There'll be there'll be info and a link probably down below and such. Um, but with that too, uh, one of the reasons that MIF is happening is because of our sponsors for it. Uh, without them, they've been awesome. They've just been rolling with the punches uh, with all the changes and direction it's going. And now that it's moved all online, they've still stuck with us. So. Huge thank you to our sponsorships. Uh, in that too, we're still able to give out prize money. So yeah, you can submit your films to one of the categories and if you win, there's prize money and this is all because of our sponsors. So again, big thanks to them. And last thank you before we get into it is to Creative Live. Uh, the reason why you're watching Office Hours is because of them. There's, a, there's someone behind the screen that's way smarter than me that knows a lot about live broadcasting that'll do all these fancy transitions between us and our guests. So big thanks to them. And they're also been nice enough to let us use their studios for a lot of the MIF filming coming up. So big shout out to Creative Live, to our sponsors and all that. And so with that, let's talk, let's talk to our guest, Oliver Hughes. How's it going? Yo, Andrew, thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, likewise. Um, so as I said, this is all about just talking about filmmaking and the aspects of it and hopes to encourage people to get out and create a bit more. Uh, how did you find filmmaking and what is your specialty? What is your niche in filmmaking? Right. Well, I originally found filmmaking in 2014 by just having a good friendship with a guy who had started a freelance career. But before that, I wanted to begin a career in actual film scoring. So I went to school in Nashville to be a film composer, learned audio production, music production, and then long story short, petered out, gave up, quit, gave up all my dreams, decided I should wear slacks and khakis and go sell windows for a living, which I did. Ended up in Denver, then came back to Kansas City where I grew up and uh, tried to start a, a regular big boy career and um, didn't really work out. And I'm really thankful for that because I had a chance encounter with this freelancer. His name was Bobby and uh, we started working together he knew I had done creative video stuff in high school and before that. And because of my music background, I kind of brought an audio expertise to his uh, incredible cinematography chops, and we made a great team. And so from there on, I started my own freelance business, and that's kind of how I got here. But the audio thing has always been, like, the big core of what I do. Yeah. Yeah, right on. I I actually used to play drums. I, I didn't tell you that earlier, but I played drums. So I actually had quite a bit of experience in music and getting back Good. into, I, I, if you, a lot of my editing has actually revolved around music. I actually find a lot of inspiration to, I, I will oftentimes choose the music first. You know, I think it's a Dude, huge part of films. People that are always posting stuff like music takes the longest to find. I'm like, no, I already know the music before I start the thing. So I, I agree. I think, I think it's underrated quite a bit. So with that too, what, like, I watched quite a bit of your YouTube channel. And even as someone who edits for a living, I learned so much. I watched your auto ducking, uh, auto ducking video. And I was like, sick. Like I just literally saved 30 minutes on every future project. <laughs> Good. Um, Huge. And so with your with your YouTube channel, you have this mix of a few documentaries, a lot of lesson stuff, a lot of just about your personal life. Like, what do you what do you enjoy most about creating on YouTube, um, specifically around the audio content, whether it's documentary or tutorials? Well, honestly, I mean, I love the kind of documentary style of filmmaking, and that's where I really want to go with things. Um, 
but I also love just talking about audio tools. And so I think that that's a place where they both coincide. And then when I release something, it's like the amount of effort I've put into the actual sound of the film is like has to be next level because yes. that's what I talk about. So like there's no skimping there. So I think they kind of go hand in hand. It's like when we talk about gear, when we talk about filmmaking processes or audio tools or ways of making things sound better at the end of the day, those are just small pieces of the puzzle of like sharing story. Mm -hmm. Because if you get That's better good. sound for your film, you're bringing us closer to the story that you're trying to tell. And so at the end of the day, the massive overarching 40,000 foot theme is storytelling and audio is a piece of that. I love that. It's just a small piece to the overall puzzle. I think that's such a good right. philosophy of it. Um, I like what you said earlier too, to me, you said that, uh, the same for like, same thing as cameras, like audio is a similar way that if you, you know, as filmmakers, we can get thrown uh, a phone, you know, and make a video, make a film out of it and call it, call it a day. But it's also the same thing with audio. Like a huge part of it is understanding your environment and how to work with it and how important acoustics are. You know, you could buy a $5,000 mic, but if you're filming it in a tiled bathroom, it's not going to go so well, you know? Right. Um, I would, I would be curious to hear your, um, what you have to say on the idea of how it could, how people, if they're making films on their phone, what could they do to record audio or just improve their audio to maybe edit in later or even also raw audio during their filming? Right. Well, there's a couple things to think about when we're doing just phone type filmmaking, because when we talk about audio, you, there's a whole range of things inside that that we talk about. One of them is dialogue. Many modern commercial films, personal films, YouTubes are driven by a dialogue narrative, and that's voiceover or interview content or any sort of other driven narrative by the voice. Now, that is over here in this kind of piece of the pie. It must be in mono. It cannot ever be in stereo or it will ruin your mix. So how to do that with an iPhone, you would need to get in a acoustic environment that is like suitable to not have a bunch of echoes and stuff because iPhones won't really help you out. You have to just kind of create that for them. And so say you want to record a voiceover for your project, go into your bedroom, get under the sheets, make sure you're not rustling in the sheets, just totally dampen everything, record it into your iPhone and then in post, make it a mono signal and like, you're going to have a pretty darn good voiceover. Yeah. On the other side, for natural sound, fully, any sort of other sounds that are in your mix for video, the iPhone is actually a great tool. It records in stereo. So you're getting a left and a right signal coming into your phone. And stereo is really cool because it just kind of tricks us into thinking we're hearing like the crispiest audio ever, when really it's just two signals that mirror the way our ears hear, and it's just more pleasing to listen to that way. The old school film school, I just said school twice, which is dope. But That's awesome. the old the old way of thinking is if what you're looking at is wider than your face, you should record it in stereo. If it's not, you should record it in mono. Oh. I don't really I don't really adhere to that as much. It's more like what do you want people to experience from your film? And so mm. with the iPhone, the only problem you run into is wind. Because the wind <laughs> will clip out the speakers. And we've all heard that terrible wind. Everyone's experienced that, yeah. Right. So that's the only big thing you have to watch out for if you're trying to record Nat Sounds out in the field, trying to get like ambiance so but yeah. yeah just separate those two things when you're thinking about recording with your iphone and don't be afraid to re-record later because the reality is is when we're out there doing this like a lot of times when i'm filming you like hear me breathing and grunting and making all sorts of terrible sounds and like that's why the people that run the fancy cameras on sets have a separate audio guy so anyway that's what i would say watch out for yeah. wind and record in your bed sheets <laughs> <laughs> i like that uh one thing uh, for those who don't know, could you explain a little bit what is stereo sound and what is mono? Yes, totally. So that literally just refers to how many signals are coming out. So mono meaning one. It's just one signal that is split between both speakers. It's the exact same sound. And you can think of it as like just in the center of, this, of the image of sound that you're hearing. A lot of uh, uh, processors like Premiere or Audition or whatever you're using, you can kind of go into the audio settings convert things from stereo to mono. You can flip it out and do, anyway. Stereo is the left and the right being separate signals coming in and then separate signals coming out. So again, if you're thinking of having two speakers in front of you while you're watching your film, we're not talking about 5.1 or anything complicated, a stereo signal will come two different sounds to your ears at the same time, creating a wider, more realistic soundscape. 
And that's okay. again why if you ever record dialogue stuff in stereo, it'll really mess with the mix and make everyone confused. And so, yeah, so a stereo, like let's say I'm, I'm filming you right now and um, something to the left of me happens, you would hear it in the left speaker more so. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Nice. So then well, if you good. have to yeah. use this for dialogue only, record it, but then when you get into Premiere, make sure it is summed down to mono. And we can make a video about that later if you don't know yeah. how. Do you have a do you have a tutorial on that on your YouTube? I actually don't, but now I have a good new idea. So <laughs> right on. So speaking of that, uh, I saw a ton of your like I said, I was watching some of your YouTube content on uh, just audio, like just a bunch of how to literally make it better. And I learned a bunch, but for the people who are making these films for MIF and um, all this stuff. I watched the video that you did with us where you explained a lot and you showed with your hands very well how audio was working. Um, what are some just good audio tips? Like more so, what are some good audio effects in Premiere to note right. to increase just the better quality your audio? Right, so compression is, is the number one. Um, compressors confuse everybody because when you talk to audio people about compressors, it's like hearing a college lecture and it's the saddest, most boring thing ever. And it sounds like you're reading. <laughs> text. And so I, I exist to demystify the compressor because it's the most valuable tool that you'll run into. And the okay. reason it's valuable is because what it does to the audio, you talked about me using my hands. I love to use my hands, but it like, Do in it. a sense, the compressor takes your entire dynamic range from the softest sound to the loudest sound and just squeezes it together. It just compresses the actual sound. This is not video compression. This is not data. That's a whole different compression and, and how that word is used. This is literally compressing the dynamic range of your audio. Now, why would you want to do that, Mr. Kern? The reason you want to do that me. is because <laughs> your dialogue or your voiceover, whatever is leading your narrative forward, that compression will then bring the fullness of that sound and allow it to sit at the top of the mix totally clean and unobstructed by the peaks and valleys of the sound beneath it. So a compressor is critical if you want a clear and rich and crispy mix. Okay. I, uh, I definitely used a compressor, but I never, <clears throat> excuse me, I never realized exactly what it does until I watched that video of you explain it. It's similar to how like colors work in a way. Like a, right. if you want to flatten your colors for more data or whatever, like you shoot in log, which puts it all in this section, you know, and then, right. yeah, it's, but with that, you kind of spread it out with coloring, not so much, uh, leave it the same. <laughs> right, right. But, but similar yeah. idea for sure. Right on. Are there any other effects that you are is like always a go-to for you? Yeah, I mean, compression and EQ are the two most important, and then limiters are also really important. Um, EQ is pretty easy to understand, because if you grew up with any sort of a stereo in your home, you know, bass, mid, treb, that's an EQ. It's a very mm -hmm. simple three-band EQ. Well, if you learn about EQ and how to clean things up, it's really nice to be able to do that in your mix, because this will get really technical, but like many mm -hmm. times when you're putting a whole bunch of sounds together, it gets really muddy, and like that's the word we use to describe when it's kind of bassy and the low mids are just too clashy with each other, you can scoop that out with an EQ in Premiere. Use the parametric EQ, pull everything down between like 100 and 400 hertz, about six decibels, boom, it'll clean everything up. So EQs mm -hmm. are an incredibly important tool, especially for the human voice. Um, but a limiter comes in really handy when you're exporting your video, when you're all done with your mix, to control the actual loudness of things and keep it from clipping. A limiter is just like a compressor, it compresses differently, but it can help you raise the volume without letting that volume go over the threshold, which causes that distortion, that clipping that nobody likes. So, again, these are these are like trying to be rudimentary as possible, not trying to go <laughs> over anybody's head, but like compression, EQ, limiting, those three will help you out a lot if you've never used them. That's awesome. And a lot of this stuff is just on your YouTube, yeah? Right. I did a whole like audio tools course a couple of years ago that I want to like reboot and do it in modern day. I think it was 2017 when I made that, but it was just like a deep dive into what they do and why. Like, why do we actually use them? Yeah. So many people like me, before I got started, it's like, well, what do these tools even do? Why can't I just put the sounds in and get it out? You know, it's a, in a lot of ways, I think it's like color grading where it sounds good on paper, but when you actually get into it, it can really get over your head so quick and you don't know what you're so doing quick. and you have to really learn what the wheels are and what the difference between hue and saturation is and all that stuff. So 
it's a lot like that, but uh, less popular and again, hard to find good content on that stuff. So it, it, it really is like, that is, that is so true. I, I was actually exporting a video yesterday and I, I actually did one of the tips I heard you say is like, I think you told Taylor in the video you did with us where you said, put it like your volume all the way down and listen to it back. And if you can hear everything. And I think what you said, like hit the nail on the head is like, you kind of know what you want, but you don't know how to get there. And that was like me. I was just like, ah, export is fine. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> I, I wish I would have known what to do exactly. And same with color grading, like so many of those aspects, like, you know what you want, you know how to do it, or you, you want to know how to do it. It's just a matter of actually putting it in the practice and knowing what tools to tweak, what ga uh, little gears to change and all that. So, yeah. Right. Nice. And so with music, um, kind of just backtracking here, what was your main instrument? Yeah, well, uh, let's see. Second grade, I started uh, piano lessons with Cheryl Herbert, who lived down the street from us, and I hated everything Cheryl about Herbert. it. I love Cheryl. <laughs> She's great. Respect. But, like, I hated piano lessons because she wanted to, like, teach me piano through math. Like, let's learn rhythm and let's stick with that and make it very mechanical, and I hated everything about that. Let me tell you a very quick anecdotal story about when Go I for first it. realized I had, I had groove in my soul. I don't know if this will make sense to everybody, but like the metronome, you play to a metronome to learn how to stay on tempo. And like it hits on one and three. And like you play to that metronome and it's very mechanical. One time I was playing the piano and I kind of got off the rhythm. And when I came back on, the metronome was playing on two and four, like a snare drum. So like it went from like this really rhythmic, learning the piano to like this yeah like, like where the I snare like, hits are right and i'm no. like vibing out in fourth grade and mrs herbert stopped me and got me back to one and three and i never <laughs> looked back so i live a two and four life i i live the two and four life too i usually do the one two three four life i like to be, be kept in line just enough you know <laughs> there you go there you go but yeah i started with the piano and that's like the the root of my understanding of music comes from understanding those keys um, but guitar is my main now, and I love the guitar. Oh, right on. Yeah. Sweet deal. And so as you developed into audio and filmmaking, I watched the most recent documentary on that you put on YouTube about immigrants. Would you just talk a little bit about that and also a little, like, maybe behind-the-scenes stuff you might want to share about it? Right. Yeah. Well, that was a really uh, slow-evolving project that started actually December of 2016 when uh, Jarrett Meek, who, was, who runs this nonprofit in the inner city of Kansas City, Kansas, he came to me uh, through a mutual friend and was just like, hey, there's a story here. We need to tell it. And so we kind of started off, but it, I realized quickly that we had something a little bit bigger than what he wanted, and I think it just took time to extrapolate. And man, that was like an eye-opening, incredibly fun life-giving project to be a part of for the last three years because yeah. I got to go into places I didn't know existed, meet people I didn't know were there, and like see the amazing transformation that those people are making on our inner cities and we don't even know it. Mm. And so, yeah, that one was, that was real fun. But I will, I will have you know that every single interview was, was recorded in as controlled environment as possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, when you're the, doing guerrilla style stuff, you got to just go with what you got. So you just kind of have to bless and release, call it good. Yeah. Just keep going. And that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of documentary that kind of throws all the rules out the window. Cause if the story's there, nobody cares at the end of the yeah. day, as long as the threshold of quality is met, mm. nobody cares if you're shooting it on a red eight K it's like, if the story's there, if the heart is there, it yeah. doesn't matter. And I mean, that's why about, it's so important to do. Yeah, it's all it's all about that. Like like you were saying, it's like just a piece to the puzzle. And you know, right. if you as as long as like the storyline is there, it's it's okay. Yeah. Right. Um. Sweet. So, if those of you who are just joining us now, we are. I'm interviewing Oliver Hughes. Uh, he has a YouTube channel. He's an audio engineer, filmmaker, all that jazz. Um, and if you're just joining us now, you didn't hear my spiel about myths. So I'll just give that really quick. Um, we're just doing a film festival, and these office hours are an effort to promote that and to encourage you guys to submit some films. They have a few weeks left. And, yeah, there's prize money. The playing field is open. It's all online, so any age can join. Um, so, yeah, that's that. And... Yeah, with that, I have a, I watched, I want to get back into this. I have this question for you. I watched your video called, um, I believe it was titled, How Do I, Why Do I Create? 
-hmm. and it was like a lot of older footage a lot of really good storyline of why you create um and i really like the whole premise of it in it's it's really rooted in the process you know it's not necessarily you don't really arrive somewhere with creating you know because the dream is doing like the dream is just the process of it and doing of it um I want to hear a little bit of your philosophy on like why you create and what I guess what drives you to create because you put out a lot of stuff on YouTube and I mean there has to be some sort of drive behind that you know right yeah I mean I I think I made that video I don't know two years ago now and like it was just kind of a spur of the moment thing and I sometimes like go back to it to re-inspire my own self because you know I get lost all the time and get overwhelmed and burn out as much as anybody, maybe more than everybody. But um, the whole thing about the process for me is like, you know how fun it is when like a new project shows up or you have a good idea. Like that's just, it's it's amazing, it's titillating. Like it gives us life. And then you know what it feels like to rap and like release and like get the feedback and have it out there. But those things are are like the fleeting pleasures in life that don't sustain. And what Hmm. like is real to me is the gritty, sweaty, hard work of that process. Yeah. And like, I see creating as an externalization of like my own process as a human being. And I think that when we can commit to that process, we're like aligning ourselves in many ways with the natural order of things. Like I was made to make, and I'm here to make. And the way to make is to make myself and then who I become makes the art that is then seen. Hmm. It's not like I can one off and just do something. It's like everything I create is an extension of who I am inside or an extension of something I've experienced in my life. And so being obsessed with that process is being obsessed with creating beauty in many ways. And like, it's hmm. not pretty, it's ugly. I, you know, I've broken so many little things in my studio out of absolute frustration. And I'm not ashamed to say that because it happens, you know, like it's just, (laughs) it's the dirty grind of like, you got to put your head down and just go sometimes. Um, But yeah, I just love talking about that. And, you know, I think it was Nick Saban, the coach of the uh, Alabama, the football team, who I heard him talk one time and I'm not representing him as a person in any way. I think he's a sleeve bag, but (laughs) this, this idea stuck with me where he doesn't show his guys like how to score touchdowns, how to make sacks, he gets them obsessed with the process of their strategic position. Like get obsessed with your footwork, get obsessed with firing off at the exact moment, get obsessed with where your hands are. And when he has those guys in that mindset, the touchdowns take care of themselves. Yeah. And in so many ways that's creating, if I can get obsessed with getting myself in the zone and doing the hard work, setting my little tomato timer for 25 minutes when I hate (laughs) working to get just something done, then the process equals the product. And that's kind of my thing. That's that's so well said. I I really love that. I I I, um, I subscribe to an author I really love, and I was subscribed to his email thread, and he released this whole part on the dream is doing, and that's really what it is. Because I mean, I've had my share of successes, and I'm sure you have too. But when I'm growing and learning, that's when I feel most alive. When I'm struggling to learn this stupid thing in After Effects that isn't working. That's right. like when I figure it out, like that, those those moments that are just like, I did it. Like I focus so much on my footwork or on my this or that, that now it makes sense and now it's clicking, you know? Dude, it, to me, you know, the moments of happiness in life and joy is like the plane letting off the gas and starting to fall back to earth <laughs> where it's like, it's blissful and nice, but you're headed for destruction. If you don't stay uncomfortable, you will not take off. Yeah. That's my do you have any, so like creativity is always this kind of like free flowing thing that people kind of imagine like that, but do you have any practical tips on sustaining it at all? I'm always interested yeah. to hear people's ways of doing it. Oof. Yeah, man. Well, after the last two months, uh, it's, it's pushed a lot of us, I think, to the edge of what sustainability is. Oh, um, man. Yeah. But man, I'm still here. And like the little work that I have had or the YouTube stuff that I'm trying to finish. I'll just share the Pomodoro technique because it's like super easy and actually yeah. is really effective. Have you heard of this? Uh, it's where you the set name a timer. sounds familiar. Yeah, you get a little timer, like a kitchen timer, tomato timer, and you set it for 25 minutes. And literally all you have to do is work for 25 minutes. Like anybody can work for half an hour. It's easy. Mm-hmm. Just do it. 
And at the end of 25 minutes, it dings, you take a five minute break. You get up, stretch your legs, get some water, move around, come back. Just do it again, 25 minutes, that's all. And by, by the time two hours go by, you realize that you're actually in the zone and you're like totally flown. Yeah. Because like for me, I, I, as a creative, I'm highly emotional and I tend to be overcome with my emotions all the time, which means like if I don't feel like working, it's impossible to work. This is the hack that has gotten me through that like 90% of the time. Yeah. No, that's that's cool. I've I've definitely done that before. I didn't know how to name. Um, so that's good to know. Yeah. I've been I've been scheduling my days a lot more recently. Um, sure. And just having that that blocked out, and I'll be like, oh, from this time I'm gonna wake up, eat breakfast, and I'll be at my studio by this time. And like something about that has helped my creativity flow a ton, as well as like I think you can relate. As creatives, our minds are always everywhere when we don't want them to be. And so having some sort of routine regiment to keep us in a framework, I think it really is beneficial. It's definitely um, definitely helped my creativity in that process a ton. So, All right. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, so with your YouTube channel, um, this will be my last question, and then we have a little Q&A, which sure. I will pull up in a second. Um, you have all this stuff, you have the documentaries, you have the tutorials, you have some of your life stuff, like where do you wanna be going with it? Or like, do you have any plans to go somewhere with it or what's next kind of thing or, yeah. Well, actually, yes. I mean, I, I made a video in early 2020 about my big plan moving forward and um, the whole COVID crisis has put a giant wrench in that and I'm totally fine with that. I needed a lot of me time to become the person that I'm gonna make this stuff next, if you will. but. I'm going to, I'm kind of focusing on four different shows. Um, Cause again, my channel is a little bit disjointed. It's like an audio tutorial here, a very personal video here, a documentary there, a vlog. Um, but mm. what I'm going to start doing is like more of a show based channel where once a month you'll get a tutorial. So like the first week of the month will be a tutorial. Second week of the month will be a gear review. Third week of the month, a vlog, and then the fourth week is going to be a creative conversation where I sit down very much like what we're doing right now and just mm. talk to somebody who in some way has made it or is making it as a creative entrepreneur no matter the field. Um, and that way it's like four different shows, you know what to expect, and then interspersed in there are the little docu projects that I'm working on here and there. So that's the plan for the remainder of 2020 is to just kind of organize it a little bit better. Nice. Nice. That's that's a good plan. It's always important to have a plan with like what you're creating because kind of like the puzzle piece, like you have to have that big vision idea um, as well as, yeah, it's just having a goal. Without a goal, you can't really score, you know? Right. Very true. Um, so I'm looking at a few questions in the chat here. Um, mm -hmm. Someone asked, Austin Crawford asks, who inspires you? And he said, Mr. Hughes. <laughs> That's fancy. Ooh. Mr. Hughes. You know what? I am, <clears throat> at least right now, I, so many people inspire me, from YouTubers to filmmakers to everything in between. But right now, I'm like back on this phase of being just utterly fascinated with Hans Zimmer, the great <laughs> film composer. We all go many through that, whether we are in filmmaking <laughs> right. or not, I feel like, you know? But like, I just... Yes, he has a team of people that he works with, but like he cranks out such incredibly unique and also like just perfectly fitting scores on a timetable that I can't even imagine, like five, six, seven a year or even more. But like I've just been going through some of his work and just like being so inspired with like what's in his head when he's up all night in his red velvet studio sitting at the piano and Chris Nolan is like, hey, we got this space opera that you know nothing about come up with something and he like writes the organs for interstellar and it's like one of my favorite scores of all time so hmm. anything hans is totally getting me right now good yeah i feel like everyone goes through that i'm also so impressed by like every now and then i'll just like look at what he does and it's like oh like he made uh inception as well as like the call of duty soundtrack i'm like what the right. hell does this guy not do you yeah, know it's and just... like the planet earth series yeah was all hans. yeah like, it's crazy he's all over the place he's a monster um somewhat matt johnson said oliver is the most fashionable youtuber in kansas <laughs> that's probably true i don't know any other youtubers in kansas <laughs> <laughs> pretty that's pretty easy to claim eh yeah i love it that's got the best beard in the entire united states for the record there you go right on just looking at any other questions here if anybody has questions feel free to comment them in the youtube chat all that 
Um, oh, someone asked, can any, uh, where can they find the documentary? The one I mentioned about the immigrants? Right. So that one right now is still going to be the pinned video on my YouTube channel. It's called Overlooked. Um, it's going to be up there until it's not. So it should be right when you go to my channel, it should be right there front and center. Yeah, it was it was really good. It's well worth the time watching it. That was my first introduction to you. And I was like, all right, like time to dig in deeper. <laughs> it's a good <laughs> intro for sure. Good. Cool. Well, I mean, that's like 30 minutes right there. So um, with that, do you have any last things to say or any parting words or any encouragement to people? Yes. As a smaller YouTuber, um, you know, I still get plenty of comments um, and I just read a lot of like hope from people that doesn't have a lot of teeth in it. Like, how can I do this? How can I be that? How did you get to here? How do you, and it's like everything that we've just talked about is how you do it. You just have mm -hmm. to freak. You just have to go for it. And yeah. many times what's stopping you from going for what you want is some belief about yourself that's negative. Dude. And man, this could be a massive deep dive into what that's like, but like you got to go in and find out what's there. And until you find your own treasure, it's going to be really hard for you to push through those difficult moments of like, I'm not worth this. I shouldn't make this. I'm not good enough for this. I, I'm a fraud. It's like, guess what? I'm all those things every freaking day. Hmm. But that process is working through anyway, doing it anyway, irregardless of what people think, say, or feel about your work. And then you end up working on how you feel about yourself. And it's a, it's an upward spiral into becoming who you want to become and making what you want to make. So just do it. Damn. That was, that was really well said. I know exactly what you mean when you say all that. And I think that is a part of the creative process. So yeah, someone said he's preaching and teaching right now. And that's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, love cool. It. So that's pretty much the end of this live session, Oliver. Thanks a ton for tuning in. Kern, thanks for having me, man. It's been a yeah. pleasure. Yeah, I'm excited to see the, all the more content you're going to be putting on YouTube in the future. I'm excited for it. Absolutely, brother. Cool. So thanks again, guys, for turning, tuning into Office Hours here. Uh, this is the third episode. Again, this is to encourage you guys during this weird pandemic season we're going through and just to encourage creativity and promote that through this time. Um, again, Oliver is really great at audio, uh, really great at the audio side of filmmaking. So go check out his channel. And if you're trying to do films and if you want to submit your film to MIF and you need to know how to do better audio, boom, this is your guy. Um, so yeah, big thanks to him for tuning in. And yeah, if you're gonna, if you want to know more about MIF, we have some links about that. And yeah, we'd love to see your films there. So thanks guys and see you on the next office hours maybe. <laughs>